Reverend Sir Stephen Timms. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At question number one. Number one. <laughs> Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know the House will join the nation and the Commonwealth in sending our very best wishes to their Majesties, the King and Queen, ahead of the Parliament. This will be a moment of extraordinary national pride, a demonstration of our country's character, and an opportunity to look to the future in the spirit of service, unity, and hope. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Sir Stephen Timms. Mr. Speaker, at question time last week, column 725, the Prime Minister referred to record numbers of people in work. In fact, as he knows, the number of people in work at the moment is still less than it was just before the pandemic, 122,792 less, according to the latest official figures. Will he reassure the House that he's not slipping into the bad ways of his predecessor but one? Uh, and will he properly correct the incorrect statement he made last week? Mr. Mr Speaker, that clarification has already been made, uh, Mr Speaker and Hansard, but there are near record numbers of people in work uh, and in payroll, and that is, thanks, that is thanks to the actions of this Government, Mr Speaker, one record we're very proud of. Very very much, Mr Speaker. Um, Non-compliant hand car washes seem like a cheap and quick way to have our cars washed. But unfortunately, behind this £1.8 billion industry is hidden money laundering, fraud, drug dealing, prostitution, labour abuse, modern-day slavery, tax avoidance and many other sinister crimes. Um, this is an estimated half a billion pound lost in tax revenue, a poor factor for illegal migration, and the pollutants often used are damaging to the environment. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's time that we now step away from the voluntary scheme and have a mandatory scheme to protect people? Well, Mr Speaker, we expect all businesses to follow the law, including providing fair pay and working conditions for their employees. We're tackling exploitation in the labour market, especially by increasing funding for enforcement bodies to over £35 million a year, and we will continue to keep the position of hand car washes under close review. But now comes the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the coronation? Across the House, we're all looking forward to the celebrations this weekend. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister know how many mortgage payers are paying higher rates since the Tory party crashed the economy last autumn? Well, Mr, Mr. Speaker, our, our, record, our record on home ownership is crystal clear. Because of our tax cuts, 90% of first-time buyers now don't pay any stamp duty at all, Mr Speaker. And, la and last year we saw the largest number of people buying their first home in 20 years, Mr Speaker. That's a Conservative government delivering on people's aspirations to own their own home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, the question was how many people are paying more on their mortgages each month. And the answer that the Prime Minister avoided giving is 850,000. Nearly a million people paying more on their mortgage each month because his party used their money as a casino chip. That's why George Osborne called them economic vandals who created a self-inflicted financial crisis. Not, not for the Prime Minister and his non-dom thing, not for the super wealthy they gave tax cuts to, but for mortgage holders all across the country. So, does the Prime Minister know how many more people will be joining them on higher mortgage rates by the end of this year? Yes. Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, thanks to the actions we're taking, in fact, the Bank of England is showing that public expectations of inflation have now eased to a 15-month low. Mr. Speaker. Consumer confidence is at the highest level that it has been at since Russia invaded Ukraine, and because of our stewardship of the public finances, we can see a clear way to reduce debt and bring interest rates down. But, Mr. Speaker, he keeps in this habit of quoting the former Labour shadow chances. We know that our plans will deliver lower inflation and lower interest rates, but we know, we know that his plans, his plans just mean more 
more debt, Mr. Speaker. And I quote, and I quote, year after year after year. Those aren't my words. That's the assessment of the former Labour Shadow Chancellor. Mr Speaker, the, the question was how many more people this year are going to be paying more on their mortgages? Yeah. And the answer that he avoided giving again, he knows these answers. He's, yeah, he's got the stats there in front of him. 930,000 people. So by the end of this year, I know they don't want to talk about it, that's why he won't answer the questions. By the end of this year, nearly two million homeowners counting the cost of the tourist economic vandalism with every mortgage payment they make. And it's not just those who already own their home that are counting the cost of Tory recklessness. The average deposit for a first-time buyer is going up to £9,000. Does he even know how long it would take an average saver to put that sort of money aside? Mr Speaker, that's, that's why... Mr Speaker... That's why we've introduced a 95% mortgage guarantee scheme, Mr Speaker. It's why we're helping people in social housing own their own home through our first homes and our shared home ownership schemes. But, Mr Speaker, I said, I said these, these things are working because I said last year we had a record number of first-time buyers, the highest number in 20 years. It was, Mr Speaker, twice the number of first-time buyers than Labour ever managed, Mr Speaker. So whilst Labour failed homeowners, the Conservatives are delivering for them. Yeah. Mr Speaker, every week, whatever the topic, he stands there and pretends everything is fine across the country. And every week he does so, he reinforces just how out of touch he is. £9,000, ha ha ha, £9,000 would take four years. They think it's funny that ho- nine thousand four years four years for the average saver to save £9,000. Or, or, or to put it a different way, in terms the Prime Minister will understand, roughly the annual bill to heat his swimming pool. <laughs> but for most people, for most people, four more years of scrimping is a hammer blow to their ambitions. And now he's kicking them when they're down, because his decision to scrap housing targets is killing the dream of home ownership for a generation. Why does not admit he got it wrong and reverse it? Mr Speaker, I promise to put local people in control of new housing. And I'm proud that that's what I delivered within six weeks of becoming Prime Minister. Now, he wants to impose top-down housing targets. He wants to concrete over the green belt and ride roughshod over local communities. Now, previously, Mr Speaker, he did say, he's on record in saying, local people, local communities should have more power, more control. Now he's U-turned. Just another in a long list of broken promises. Mr Speaker, the only power he's given to local communities not to build houses. And we know why he won't change course. He admitted it last month. His councillors simply don't want to build the houses local people need, so he's given them a way out. Picture the scene as he explains this to a family. Mum and Dad paying four grand extra on the mortgage because the tourists tanked the economy. Their eldest paying hundreds more in rent. Their youngest still stuck in the spare room because they need an extra £9,000 for a deposit. Then, then along comes the Prime Minister and merrily tells them, sorry for crashing the economy, we don't want to talk about that. (laughs) Sorry I can't help you with the house building, but my councillors don't like it. Oh, and before I go, here's a massive council tax increase for your troubles. Why doesn't he stop the excuses, stop blaming everyone else, and just build some houses instead? Mr Speaker, our memories aren't aren't that short. We all know what happened last time when they were in power. There was no money left for the country. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the record. Let's talk about the Labour record on house building, Mr Speaker. In London, the former Conservative Mayor built 60,000 affordable homes in his first five years in office. How many did the current Labour, ma- Labour Mayor manage? Half of that, Mr Speaker. In, in Wales, we need 12,000 new homes a year. How many have Labour built in the last year? Half of that, Mr Speaker. As ever, Labour talk and the Conservatives deliver. Mr Speaker, 
debt doubled since 2010, yeah. growth down, yeah. tax yeah. up, yeah. the economy yeah. crashed. Mr yeah. Speaker, they're going to need a bigger note. Yeah. <laughs> and it's right. But week after week, we debate the issues facing in this place. But, but looking beyond the elections tomorrow, we also have a hugely significant weekend coming up with the King's coronation. For most, this will be the first time they have seen a monarch crown. And I hope, and I know across the House people will hope, that people across the country enjoy the ceremony, the street parties and, of course, the extra day off. 300 million will tune in. The world will see our country at its best, celebrating the beginning of a new chapter in our history. But it will also be a reminder of the loss of our late Queen, Elizabeth II, and a chance again to remember all that she gave to our country through her dedicated service. So will the Prime Minister join me in honouring our late Queen and wishing the new King a long and happy reign? Mr Mr. Speaker, as as I, I said at the outset, we're all looking very much forward to the coronation. It will be a very special moment in the history uh, of our country, and I know that we will join with the country in celebrating it. But before we get to the coronation weekend, Mr. Speaker, we have an important day tomorrow, and the choice before the country is clear. When they go to that ballot box, they can see a party that stands for higher council tax, higher crime, and a litany of broken promises, Mr. Speaker. Meanwhile, we're getting on with delivering what we say with lower council tax, lower crime, and fewer potholes. The choice is clear. Vote Conservative, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Labour run Kirklees Council, Mr. Speaker, as you know, have reneged on a deal to house the National Rugby League Museum at the George Hotel. They've also declared a climate emergency, but they have one of the worst recycling rates in the country. They're building on green fields and now on green belt. They're demolishing Home Firth Indoor Market. We're blighted by litter and fly tipping, and now they're proposing to chop down mature trees in urban areas. Does oh, Mr. Oh, agree with me? No, you will sit down a moment. I presume you're going to ask a question. You've made a great step. Quick question. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that local people can have their say on Kirk Lees's appalling record by voting Conservative this week? Yeah. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right. It's typical Labour saying one thing and doing the other, Mr Speaker. It's only the Conservatives that are going to protect the Green Belt. It's the Labour Party that are going to concrete over it. And that's why in Kirklees and elsewhere, tomorrow, vote Conservative, Mr Speaker. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, in 2010, David Cameron convinced Nick Clegg to drop his pledge on university tuition fees. Yep. Does the Prime Minister intend to take the credit for convincing the leader of the Labour Party oh, to do likewise? Prime Minister. Well, I, I, I thank the honourable gentleman for the question. It is, I, I'd say it's, it's hard to keep up, Mr. Speaker, with a list of broken promises. What I would say uh, on tuition fees is I'm proud that under this government we now have a record number of people that are going to university from disadvantaged backgrounds, Mr. Speaker, and that's because the efforts we've placed to put more money into supporting those people and those communities to fulfil their aspirations alongside fantastic new apprenticeships in every part of our country. M Mr Speaker, for the avoidance of any doubt, the Liberal Democrats don't believe in abolishing tuition fees. The Conservatives don't believe in abolishing tuition fees. And of course, the Labour Party, now with their own Nick Clegg moment, don't believe in abolishing tuition fees either. But Mr Speaker, is it, is it not the case that the main Westminster parties don't offer young, offer young people any hope at all, do they? Yeah. I, I, actually, actually, I'll gently point out 
to the uh, honourable gentleman that if you are from a disadvantaged background, you are far more likely to go to university in England than you are in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Conservative, the, the, the Conservative Police and Crime Commissioner in Dorset has delivered 174 new police officers, he has quadrupled the rural crime team and has made Dorset the sixth safest county. As recorded crime is 34 per cent higher under Labour Police and Crime Commissioners, does the Prime Minister agree with me that only Conservatives can be trusted to keep local communities safe and make sure offenders face the justice they deserve. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right. It is a simple statement of fact. Crime is lower in areas which have Conservative Police and Crime Commissioners. And I am delighted that Dorset has been selected as one of the areas to pilot our new immediate justice scheme, which will deliver swift and visible punishment so victims of antisocial behaviour know that it will be treated seriously and with all urgency. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. His Government's vile and immoral refugee ban bill and the toxic language coming from the Home Office isn't even dog-whistle politics. It is a giant, hard-right foghorn blasting out a poisonous them-and-us narrative, and it plumbed new depths last week when the Home Office Minister claimed that people trying to come to the UK, and I quote, tend to have completely different values to those in the UK. Can he explain what he thinks are so different about the values held by the people of war-torn Sudan? And can he tell us what values are stopping him from creating a Sudanese family visa scheme like he did for the people of Ukraine? Well, Mr Speaker, this country has a proud history of welcoming almost half a million refugees over the past several years, and we will always continue to do so. But our ability to do that is absolutely hampered when we have tens of thousands of people illegally crossing the channel every year. And it's precisely because we want to help the most vulnerable people, whether they be in Syria and Afghanistan, Sudan and elsewhere, we, we must get a grip of this problem, break the cycle of the criminal gangs and target our resources and compassion on those who most need it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thanks to this Conservative Government and £1.8 million from the Brownfield Land Release Fund, the Conservative-led Solihull Council is getting on with regenerating Kingshurst Village Centre, creating space for new businesses and new homes. But when it comes to economic regeneration, none of the opposition parties have a viable plan, not the Greens, not the Lib Dems and not the Labour Party. And a Labour candidate has gone so far as to scare local people into thinking that the development won't go ahead, despite spades on the ground. So does the Prime Minister agree with me? While the opposition talked down opportunity of the creation of jobs, when it comes to investing in our communities, it's only the Conservative-led Solihull Council yeah. that can do it well, Mr Speaker, I agree with my honourable friend, and I'm so glad to see the local Conservatives delivering for the people of Solihull, with dozens of new family homes, new flexible commercial space, and a new integrated health, social care and community hub. As he said, it's clear, for his local area, only the Conservatives can deliver. Alan Brown. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, imagine seeing the car in front of you swerving erratically or suddenly breaking for no reason, risking your car slamming into the back of that, endangering those daft enough not to wear seat belts. Now, this is not the actions of a drunk or reckless driver, but my constituents experience using Tesla in autopilot mode. Software still in beta phase, but deemed suitable for cars near public roads. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss the issues with Tesla's autopilot and instigate an urgent critical safety review in terms of its suitability for operation and the licensing of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I am sorry to hear about what happened to the Honourable Member's constituent. I will ensure that he gets a meeting with the Transport Secretary uh, to discuss the safe regulation of autonomous and self-driving vehicles. Cole McCarthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Labour-run City of Lincoln Council has destroyed the 40-year reputation of our city's Christmas market and the Christmas cheer that Lincoln benefits from annually. The dereliction of their role, choosing to take the easiest option behind closed doors in secret, in cancelling the market, shows Labour's neglect and disregard for small local businesses, charities and entrepreneurs and voters. Labour councillors Lincoln should be ashamed of their actions and have rightfully been likened to the Grinch. Order. Mr Brennan, I don't need you shouting from the back row. I've always offered a cup of tea to this side, but it's equally opportunity for you to take one. Come on, Carmen. 
I, th I thank the member from the opposite side for the extra minutes he's given me, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Tomorrow the people of Lincoln will have the chance to remove... I, I will not count on that. <laughs> Tomorrow the people of Lincoln will have the chance to remove from office the anti-business, socialist scrooges yeah, yeah, yeah. and elect local Conservatives. Does my right honourable friend the Prime Minister agree with me that for better run local services, business friendly and support order? order. I think in fairness to the Prime Minister, I think the text went out. I think he's got the answer. Come on, Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, I share my honourable friend's disappointment that after a decision taken by the Labour on Council, behind, as he said, closed doors, there will no longer be a Christmas market in Lincoln, ending its 40 years of history. Lincoln deserves better, and I urge the people of the city to vote Conservative. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ahead of tomorrow's local elections, I have been campaigning in Medway and Swindon. The word on the doorstep is that people are ready for a change, and will be switching their votes from the Conservatives to Labour. However, I am concerned that only 4% of those without valid ID have applied online for a voter authority certificate. So will the Prime Minister commit to a post-election review of how many people have effectively been disenfranchised by his government's response to the virtually non-existent problem of voter fraud? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, 98% of people already possess a suitable form of voter ID and the government made available free alternative ID for those that do not have it. The Pilots have demonstrated it hasn't uh, significantly impacted turnout, and indeed, this was a policy that was introduced by the Labour Party in Northern Ireland all those years ago. It's, it, it's, common, it's common in European countries, it's common in Canada, and it's absolutely right that we introduce it here too. Yeah. Dr. Mahindra. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Speaker. Since getting elected in 2019, yeah. I have been inundated with correspondence from my constituents in South West Hertfordshire rightly complaining about huge speculative developments on our beautiful Greenbelt land. Lib Dem controlled Three Rivers District Council continue to dither and delay their local plan. Does he agree with me that the choice tomorrow is simple? Vote Conservative to protect our Greenbelt or vote Lib Dem for massive developments on unsport land? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend raises an important point. And it's always the same with Liberal Democrats, saying one thing and doing the other. We've all seen it, Mr Speaker. It's the Conservatives that are party of local decisions taken by local people, and it's only the Conservatives that will protect the Greenbelt. Bernie Kelly Foy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unable to secure an NHS dental appointment, my constituent, Ray, was forced to go private. It was then discovered that he had a large aggressive tumour in his face and jaw, which required 16 hours of gruelling surgery to remove it. If, it hadn't, if he hadn't been able to afford it, Ray might not be with us now. This is yet another chapter in the horror story that is the decay of dentistry under this government's watch. Yeah. So will the Prime Minister accept NHS dentistry is in crisis and will he meet with me and the British Dental Association to ensure that no one loses their life because they couldn't get a dental appointment? Yeah. Yes or no? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry to hear what happened to the Honourable Lady's uh, constituent uh, and that's why the NHS has recently reformed dental contracts to improve access. We now invest over £3 billion a year. There are over 500 more dentists working in the NHS this year than last year. Uh, and indeed, discussions are ongoing between the Department for Health and uh, the NHS around dentistry. And DHSC is planning to outline further reform measures in the near future. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Blow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single young person that gets on the housing ladder under a Conservative government makes our communities more. Uh, sustainable. Would my right honourable friend agree that in order to build the right type of housing and speed it up, we need to fund planning authorities properly through innovative funding? Well, Mr Speaker, my uh, honourable friend, as ever, makes an excellent point, and that's why the reforms that we introduce will provide incremental resources to planning authorities to make sure that planning decisions can be taken quicker. But also, we've strengthened the ability of local communities to put in place local plans. Mr Speaker, this is the best way for our towns, cities, villages to have control over the development in their area and make sure that it happens in the way that they are comfortable with, and I know that he's supportive of that too.
Pauline Lynch. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The recent ITV documentary, Life and Death, Stories from the Edge, followed Halifax mum, Izzy. Her prepayment energy bills have tripled, and she was relying on a local primary school, Ash Green, who are providing free breakfast, budget cooking classes, and a hardship fund for their families. When head teacher Mungo Shepherd is asked, does he worry about the children at school when he goes home at night, he says, all the time. It never leaves you. Does the Prime Minister think it's right that things are so bad that schools are having to become the fourth emergency service for the families that they support? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, because of the actions we've taken, a typical family, including those like Izzy's, will be seeing half of their energy bills paid for by the government. That is support worth £1,500 extended in the most recent budget. For the most vulnerable in our society, there's additional support, and £900 for those on welfare, Mr Speaker, and through the holiday activity and food programme, support for families with the cost and support for food during the holidays. But I would also say, for Izzy and others that are in particular need, they should talk to their council because the Chancellor has provided over a billion pounds of funding to the Household Support Fund. It's there to help families like that that need a little bit of extra assistance during this time. So John Whittingdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my right honourable friend will be aware, today is World Press Freedom Day. At a time when the need for professional and factual journalism has never been greater, will my, my right honourable friend reaffirm the government's commitment to defending media freedom worldwide? And will he redouble the efforts of the government to obtain the release of Evan Gershkovich and Vladimir Karamurza in Russia and of Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to defending media freedom worldwide because thriving independent journalism is one of the cornerstones of democracy. We absolutely condemn the politically motivated sentencing of journalists across the world and our embassies and missions work every day to protect media freedom where they are based. Uh, and I know that this is something that my right hon. Friend has been a, a right champion of throughout his career and I will look forward to him continuing to do so from a different perch as I take rather fewer questions from him over the next few months from this position. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I want to thank our police forces, who I know will be working hard across the country this weekend to support the coronation events. But police numbers in the North East are down 8% since 2010, and I know the Prime Minister is keen on his maths, so here's a sum. If Northumbria Police has lost 1,000 police officers since 2010, but gained the funding to put back 615, by how much have the Conservatives shortchanged the North East? So, Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as we saw last week, there are now a record number of police officers across the country thanks to the actions of this government, and crime is 50 per cent lower than it was when we took office. I, she, talks about investing, she talks about investing in the North East. You know, when, we, when we invested levelling up fund in her constituency, £20 million, she said it was transformational, Mr Speaker. She said it would play an important role in rejuvenating her local area. That's this Conservative government delivering not just for the North East, but for her constituents too. Mr Speaker, I was pleased to welcome the Secretary of State for Transport to Newsom recently. This was to see the progress on the Northumberland line. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that this Conservative government, and Conservative government only, is committed to development of this line, keeping levelling up on track? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend has been a fantastic champion for the restoration of this line. Indeed, it was one of the first deliveries from the Restoring Your Railways Fund, and it will be fantastic for his local communities because that connectivity will provide jobs, opportunity and employment, particularly for young people in his local area. And after years, if not decades, of neglect, it's this Conservative Government that is delivering for the people in his local area. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over 3.6 million women born in the 1950s had their pension age increased without their knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And many, like my constituent, unknowingly gave up work at 60 only to realise they had no income, they couldn't pay their bills, and some have even lost their homes. So my constituent asks the Prime Minister today, will he commit to the fair and fast payment of any compensation 
that is recommended by the Parliamentary and Health Service mm -hmm. Ombudsman to 1950s women for the injustice they have suffered due to maladministration by the Department for Work and Pensions. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, this issue has been long discussed in this place, and obviously the Honourable Lady knows there is an ongoing process which I can't comment on, but rest assured, of course, we will respond appropriately to any recommendations that come our way. Jane Hunt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yeah. 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 Asbestos Awareness Month comes to a close, I would like to draw the attention of the Prime Minister to the dangers of asbestos in workplace buildings. Please would you back the Don't Let the Dust Settle campaign for the Mesothelioma UK charity in my constituency by setting up a register of all workplaces in the country that contain asbestos and determine a timetable of eradication of this terrible substance. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this important issue? The law does require duty holders to assess whether asbestos is present, what condition it is in, and whether it gives rise to a risk of exposure. And they must draw up a plan to manage this risk, which must include removal if it can't be safely managed where it is located. But I commend her for her continued campaigning on this important issue. Madeira Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Nick swims regularly in the Thames at Shepparton. But after a recent dip, he found himself hospitalised with cellulitis for 13 days. His doctors think this was caused by polluted water. Mr Speaker, what caused that polluted water? Well, because Thames Water dumped filthy sewage just days earlier nearby. So can the Prime Minister tell Nick and everybody else, why does he think it's OK for water companies to keep polluting our rivers for another 25 years? Yeah. Mr. 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 Speaker, it, it was just last week that it was clear there's only one party that's going to protect the environment, and it's the Conservative Party. Mr. Speaker, that's, that's why we've given the Environment Agency more powers of enforcement. That's why we're moving to unlimited fines, and that's why we've got a clear plan to increase investment and increase monitoring of sewage overflows. It was a rank cynicism and hypocrisy of the party opposite. Not even show up to support those plans, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Anne Marie Morris. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Newton Abbott constituents face hosepipe bans after re torrential spring storms, and are asking me why water catchment plans have not prevented this. Reservoirs, desalination plants, and other natural catchment structures require siting where geography and geology allows. Is there a national strategy and implementation plan? increase water catchment and enable cross-water company uh, water transfer to match regional demand to supply. Yes. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, water companies publish water resources management plans which show how they will continue to provide a secure supply of water for customers, and I understand that they have been consulting on their latest drafts of these plans. And in uh, my honourable uh, friend's particular area of Devon and Cornwall, where temporary use bans are in place, DEFRA and the water regulators are closely working with South West Water to ensure that the company is taking all appropriate precautionary action to ensure that water supplies remain resilient this year. That's all for now on Prime Minister's questions.